welcome and thank you so much for clicking on this video with regard to the care of Katlikia Xiangyu Gold Coast. This is a two-in-one care collab because I am joined today by Sunita Gladstone. Sunita does not have a YouTube channel, but she was kind enough to say, I'm going to do this together with you. So we've combined the two videos into this one video. The more, the merrier. So Sunita, thank you so very, very much for showing us how you take care of your Gold Coast. And let me tell you something, what a charming, charming lady Sunita is. So I hope that you enjoy both videos in this one single video. There will not be any links in the description at this point in time. Maybe one day Sunita will have a YouTube channel because she is a natural, let me tell you. I have work to do. I have to get my Gold Coast here off the Blooming Alley shelf. In the meantime, while I prepare everything at my end, this is Sunita Gladstone in her own words as to how she takes care of her Gold Coast in Mumbai, India. Enjoy! Hello everybody. Welcome to Ninja Orchid's Care Collab video. I'd really like to thank uh, Nina for giving me this opportunity to show how I take care of my Husiang Gold, Epicatlia Husiang Gold Coast here in Mumbai. I'm often amazed by how much closer and smaller the world has gotten since we all, many of us, own the same plant across many countries in the world. I'd like to tell you something about where I live and the kind of conditions that are around me in order to explain how I grow this plant which gives some of the most beautiful and electrical colored flowers that one could see in orchids. I live in a high rise and as you can see we are faced with a lot of industrial pollution on that side and to the left of me there's a new building being constructed so there's a lot of uh, cement dust that um, pollutes uh, the air and it is in the midst of all that that I have developed this small little garden full of orchids. So since we have so much of pollution, uh, we tend to have a lot more pathogens and they become uh, concentrated when the weather changes. The monsoons are just getting over, the October heat has begun and therefore it is time to spray the uh, plants for uh, fungal and bacterial diseases which I am forced to do every two to three weeks because of the level of pollution that is there around. So the second factor that I take into consideration in the growth of my Husiang, uh, Epicatlia Husiang Gold Coast is the position of the sun with respect to where uh, my apartment is. My apartment faces a southeast sun uh, direction and the intensity of the sunlight is uh, different at different times of the year. Uh, during the hottest months of April and May, we have almost 14 hours of sunlight a day and the sun is very intense. It is very hot. It is often 42 to 43 degrees centigrade, which means I have to spray my plant uh, at least twice a day. Another factor, uh, another thing that I do in order to protect my plants is I have these uh, curtains that I draw down during the hottest part of the day in order to protect them from the direct sunlight and the heat. Otherwise, all the plants will get burnt. Uh, now the monsoons are, have just begun retreating and again it's a mixed climate so since june till october we had rain every day so there wasn't really much of uh, watering that needed to be done but of course there needed to be a lot of spraying for fungicides and bacteria uh, for fungus and bacterial infections now that the October heat has begun, mornings are extremely hot and dry and evenings become very humid and uh, it, there's, a, there's a shower almost every uh, night. Therefore, again, I need to keep my plant wet during the daytime and allow it to get wet during the nighttime. 
in order to do that the kind of potting mix that i use is just a mix of broken terracotta pieces and a little bit of charcoal so if you see the plant you will notice that many of the roots look absolutely dried but the fact of the matter is this plant has been watered early in the morning Another reason why I need to uh, maintain this kind of a mix which dries out very fast is because in the same space I grow many different kinds of plants. I have a vanda, I have cattleya, I have uh, uh, oncidiums, I have hoyas and uh, therefore in order to maintain the same level of water that all of them might need i need to keep uh, a focus on the kind of potting mix that i use so i prefer to use a potting mix which is very well draining and drains uh, very well draining and dries very fast this is my epicatlia hoosian gold coast uh, i've had her since uh, february 2020 uh, she came to me she uh, already in flower and that was from this growth after that uh, she gave me subsequent flowers in this growth and in this growth uh, during the end of last year uh, i saw very little progress in the plant uh, and that was because uh, she had uh, rotting media therefore i replanted her and uh, uh, introduced her to this new uh, media of uh, terracotta and charcoal um, uh, from pine bark uh, she did take some time to uh, recover but she did eventually and in may of this year i had a new growth which unfortunately was bitten off by a rat after that she has given me this new growth which came with a sheath but I think it was uh, just a sign that the plant had recovered and was ready to go about her thing and this is the latest growth that I have had from her. It's quite a sturdy growth. I hope that she will flower from this growth. Mm, however, there is a little bit of burning on this side as you can see that's because the weather is changing. I may need to water her some more or keep her away in the shade. Uh, on the whole, she's a very uh, happy plant to, and a very easy plant to grow. Uh, once she started flowering, every subsequent new growth gave me a bunch of 10 to 12 flowers. Uh, they last for about two weeks. They don't have a fragrance. So the color of this flower is uh, golden orange with uh, maroon markings. Uh, and uh, she's quite proficient that way. And uh, I think she's a great beginner uh, plant because once you figure out uh, how to keep her um, not too dry and not too wet uh, she just kind of grows um, i fertilize her uh, every 10 days i fertilize all my plants every 10 days and um, uh, at uh, once a month i give them a little bit of uh, silicon fertilizer uh, and uh, yeah she's been a joy uh, since the day she came and uh, she is really very beautiful when she flowers. Thank you so much for joining Sunita Gladstone and myself for this care collab on Epicatante Xiangyu Gold Coast. But let's correct that just for a moment here because currently the accepted RHS name is Catlichia Gold Coast, not to be confused with Catticlia because one of the parents would have been Epidendrum radiata, which has been changed to Prostechia radiata, hence the C-H-E-A after Cattleya. The other parent is Cattleya fabia. Those are the two direct parents for this gorgeous, gorgeous cross. There is another very interesting distant parent out there, 
called Catlia Dawiana. Then we have the human parents, Mr. and Mrs. Osmond, who in 1963 created this hybrid. That's just the basics out of the way. The theory behind this cross. It is a bifoliate, as you can see. Does that mean that it's picky? No. No, if you get the timing right for the repots, as with all bifoliates, it's always a good idea to wait for new roots to grow. And then there is no problems whatsoever, no stalling or anything. Mine looks a little bit ratty and we'll get into that as well. I've had my Gold Coast since 2018. I bought this orchid because once upon a time I worked in Bulgaria in an area, a resort area called Gold Coast. And I thought that was nice, I'll remember that. And this orchid came into my periphery and here she is now. Let me show you the damage first. Let's get that out of the way because that is kind of the elephant in the room here. She came in really good condition. It took a while for her to get established into Leca and self-watering, which is my preferred growing method here in southern Spain because my climate is so, so dry and there's not much humidity around. So I supplement with a humidity microclimate in the pot by using Leca and self-watering. And you can see that a couple of years ago, um, I damaged these leaves because you see the spotting on the leaves here and I've been trying to get rid of that from the moment that she arrived and I've put horticultural oil and soap etc trying to get rid of whatever it is that was sitting on my leaves. The orchid didn't appreciate that very much at all and caused the cells to collapse. It didn't take the orchid down it just makes the back end look a little bit nasty but you know it repeated itself into the next growth there's still a little bit left in the following growth. What I do now is just wipe her down with my garlic alcohol solution. And I'm hoping that with time, she will just grow out of whatever she came with. You can see that the growth of this year still is pretty, pretty clean. I know I have touched all the previous leaves and I'm now touching these leaves. Well, that's a risk I'm going to have to take. Whatever this is in the back, I just hope that with all the protection of the garlic alcohol that it won't spread. So that's the elephant out of the room. She is making wonderful progress. She has been in this pot one year now. I cleaned her up last year after being in the pot for two years and uh, she's already pot bound again. This orchid is extremely vigorous on the root front and Honestly, I've never really had a problem with her and she's going mad in the pot again as all the roots now growing around the surface and circling. But I don't know if I'm going to address her again next year. Every two years is sort of my rule of thumb when it comes to self-watering pots and lecan just to keep the oxygen flowing. But it also depends on the vigor of the orchid if I need to do it on a year to year basis. It will be two years again next year. So she might be on the list for repots and cleanups next year once again amazing amazing root producer and i would actually say this is a relatively easy orchid to grow because she doesn't react like a bifoliate i would say now i'm just going to put that out there because maybe she would react like a bifoliate if we don't maintain the roots and respect when she grows her roots by the time it comes for a cleanup and as you can see, for several months now, she has been growing new roots, but it wasn't her time to get cleaned up. So it would probably be around end of August, beginning of September, where she would need a cleanup because these roots have already grown substantially. And I don't like to clean up any orchid if the roots have already gotten this long. I prefer to have them as nubbins. So that's why I can say it's pretty easy with her. She hasn't given me any bifoliate diva kind of problems. And for me, that one point when new roots grow, that is the best time to address her. I've had sensational results with this orchid from year to year. She's gotten bigger, better and stronger. You can see how the growth has increased in size every single year that I've had her. And the bloom count has also increased from six to 13 and there are 18 here not all of them have opened i'm still pending some buds right here but this year i have 18 blooms on this gorgeous gorgeous hybrid and she is not fragrant but i hope that the images that i am showing throughout this video will show the best best detail of the blooms 
she develops a lot of happy sap. The only pests that I've noticed on this one that I could tell, bar the leaves in the back, are mealybugs. The happy sap on the stem is quite extensive. That's wonderful. That means she's properly, properly hydrated, but it does attract mealybugs. So I've been also dabbing with my paintbrush and garlic alcohol just to keep that a little bit in check. I don't want to water her down clearly. I don't want to ruin the blooms, but that would be the only thing. She's a great candidate to have mealybugs also hiding behind the blooms. But the garlic alcohol takes care of that and no scale or anything else. If this is a little fungus, if this is all I get on these spottings and it's over and done with, this orchid hasn't attracted any scale and she has been living kind of close by where I've had a few attempts of scale trying to manifest themselves on my orchid. This one hasn't been touched at all. When it comes to light, winter and summer, she gets steady, plenty of light. Clearly with the summer, there is longer daylight hours. With the winter, I try to supplement that with some shop lights. So as we head into winter now, when the temperatures drop below 15 degrees Celsius, I'm going to be bringing her in at night and have her under shop lights just to extend a little bit more the hours of the day where she gets enough light. She won't be doing much during the winter. She actually starts her main growth early spring. And then it takes a while for her growth of the season to start to develop. The nubbin will swell, everything's looking great, and then she'll stop and say, yeah, it's probably a little bit too soon, still a little bit nippy outdoors. Well, I'll wait. Her growth doesn't develop very, very quickly throughout the summer, but the moment I see that nubbin swell, I put in 300 parts per million of fertilizer. It's a well-balanced fertilizer with calcium and magnesium in it. And that every time the reservoir is empty. When the reservoir is empty, I use my mask as a measure and flush through twice with plain RO water just to clean out and keep the LECA from getting any mineral deposits on the surface. And then I put 300 parts per million back in again. It takes about a week for her to drink up that deposit but I don't want to start with too little fertilizer. I want to encourage strong, healthy growths and that can hold a spike of their own without me staking it up. There is a support in the pot for eventualities. I've only ever had to use it when I first potted her up. And with light training, I make sure that my growths grow upright as best as I can. That is part of the plan and it worked out beautifully here. The light direction comes from this side right here. The new growth is at the opposite end and then it grows towards the light, stays in the pot, also a lot more contained when it comes to putting her back on the shelf in the winter where there are rows and rows and rows and rows of pots and to have a gangly floppy orchid, <laughs> yeah, that's a space problem. So with the light training, this one is working out beautifully every year, no problem at all. It's very, very well behaved and I appreciate it so much. So yeah, 300 parts per million straight off the bat. I don't care if the growth is growing fast or slow. Then the interesting part is once the growth is not quite matured yet, that's when you can start seeing root action. So this one doesn't grow its roots at the same time as the growth start, but at least there's already enough energy in here. With the 300 parts per million, the reserves are fully stocked. I don't then add anything else. It's only been MSU. I have very, very rarely added calcium and magnesium as a separate supplement. And if I say very rarely, it's only if maybe I have some on hand and I'm like, yeah, you can have a little bit. My fertilizer being balanced is doing all the work on this one. It is also super well established. And for that reason, the supplementation is unnecessary. When it comes to cleaning her up and potting her up, of course, that is when the calcium, magnesium and the seaweed comes back into action because I want to give her strength so that she can continue pushing the roots after having been disturbed. Other than that, very, very rarely supplementing it. And in the summer, she always lives in my blooming alley, whether she's in bloom or not. She has her space in the middle shelf. Pot size determines where everybody goes. Also, the light levels will determine where everybody goes. And this one being such a cute, compact grower fits beautifully right up against the curtain. And they've got lots and lots of pots of this size backed up there. So she gets a lot of bright light during the summer 
but no direct sun. She's in a very protected high light location. If you are pressed for space, but you want a reliable bloomer, the one that really pops and also being October, look at the colors. It's just so fitting, all the fall colors. Absolutely striking. The blooms will last probably about three weeks at their prime and then bit by bit they will drop the lower ones first, the ones that open first, but three weeks to a month, no problems with the bloom duration here. And they maintain their vibrancy all throughout. Compact, she is not tall. She's about 30 centimeters in height, not including spike, but she's not considered a mini. This is perfect for collections with limited space. She is super reliable. I would highly recommend this orchid if you like the color combination and would like to tuck something in that is reliable and blooms all the time around fall. Let me know if you have this orchid because I would like to add more people to the Care Collab list with the Gold Coast. If you make videos, if you post to any kind of social media platform, it doesn't have to be YouTube, but if you happen to be looking in and seeing this orchid, please let me know if you want to join in and I will be in touch with you by email. My email is in the about section or you can leave me a comment below and we'll take it from there. In the meantime, I want to say thank you so, so much to Sunita Gladstone for joining me on this Care Collab right here with the beautiful Catlichia Xiangju Gold Coast. Thank you everybody so very, very much for watching this video. If you have any, any questions at all, please let me know and I'll be super, super happy to elaborate. Wishing you a beautiful, beautiful day. Thank you so very much for watching. Please stay safe and take care. Bye.